All right, good morning, everyone. I see the Zoom room is starting to fill up. Welcome to the Penn State Alumni Association's Coffee Hour. We're gonna be getting started here in just a couple minutes. We have a great guest lined up for you. He's the author of Wrestling with Angels, two-time Penn State All-American. John Hanrahan will be with us on Coffee Hour this morning. Uh, if you are here on Zoom, drop in the chat who you are and where you're Zooming in from. Let us know um, where you're watching from this morning. If you're out on Facebook Live, thanks for tuning in. Tell us who you are and where you're, uh, where you're watching on Facebook Live this morning. We'll be getting started in just a couple minutes. We want to let the Zoom room fill up here. want to let people log on to Facebook uh, for our conversation with John Hanrahan. He is a two-time All-American wrestler. He's a UWW veteran world wrestling champion. Uh, he's a Hall of Famer of the Eastern Wrestling League. John has, has lived an amazing life, and uh, we look forward to sharing his story with you. I see Paul McConaughey from Cape Cod up this morning. Good to see you as always, my friend. I see Vicki, a regular here on Coffee Hour as well. Vicki's down in Harrisburg, and our good friend right here in State College, Sean Miller, big Penn State wrestling fan. Tuning in for our coffee hour this morning, Faye down on the eastern shore of Virginia and Linda Carlo from New Milford, New Jersey. Good to see everybody out here this morning for a great conversation with John. I see Tom Weller here in State College as well. John's going to take us back to the early 80s of Penn State wrestling and talk about his success uh, on and off the mat and some of the, the challenges that he has faced head on in his life and um, how he has overcome it to be an inspiration to, to many. We'll be sharing his story in, in just a minute or two. Thanks for tuning in. Where else would you rather be than a Zoom full of Penn Staters? I'm Paul Clifford, CEO of the Penn State Alumni Association. And welcome to the Alumni Association's Coffee Hour. Each week on Coffee Hour, you can expect to hear the voices of Penn Staters talking about what they're passionate about. And you can expect to feel the pride and the power of the Penn State Network. As always, we're recording this session and closed captions are available for this event. You can find that information in the chat in Zoom or in the comments on Facebook. Well, I am really excited about today's guest. Our guest today is John Hanrahan. He is a Penn State two-time All-American wrestler. He is a UWW veteran world wrestling champion. John finished his Penn State career uh, with, a, with a stellar mark. He was the first Penn State wrestler to win 100 matches uh, and has since been inducted into the Eastern Wrestling League Hall of Fame. His new award-winning book, Wrestling with Angels, has been selected by bookauthority.org as one of the best new books for 2021. At age 25, he suffered a near-death experience. His book is an inspiring NDE life review, which chronicles his amazing experience and his return to life journey. His journey fuses the life of an elite athlete who enters the fray as a top model competing in the new arena of the world's fashion markets. GQ has featured John as the guy to know for fitness, Allure Magazine has rated John as the best personal trainer in LA. He is the owner of privatetraining.com and provides health and wellness solutions to corporations, athletes, and individuals. And folks, that's just the tip of the iceberg of what we're going to talk to John Hanrahan about today. But let's welcome John to the Zoom. John, how are you this morning? Great, Paul. It's great to be here. It is wonderful to have you. It is wonderful to have you here on Coffee Hour. Good to see you. John, take us back to the very beginning. How did you become a Penn State Nittany Lion? Oh, my God. I'm, uh, first off, first I want to give a shout out to all my Varsity S Club brothers and sisters out there and Penn State Nation. And uh, uh, I'm so, I was so fortunate to have been recruited by Penn State University. I was coming out of Virginia. I um, won the state championship there twice and, uh, and uh, was a national finalists in the high school nationals twice uh 
But I don't think Penn State was used to going out, got a, out of state back then. There's so much wealth of talents with Pennsylvania being the top wrestling school in the country. But I got on their radar. Um, the assistant coach came down, watched me at the duels. He came to the state tournament. I uh, took all the recruiting trips that the NCAA had afforded me. And the last one that came on the scene, my coach said, Penn State's interested in you. And I didn't know much about Penn State. And all I knew was they didn't have a ticket ready for me at the Eastern airline counter like the other big schools did that flew me out. I drove up. Uh, I drove up at an only four hour drive from DC, Northern Virginia. And then I realized it, it wasn't uh, that they were disrespecting me. There was no major airport back then. So <laughs> I just fell in love with Penn State. On my recruiting trip, by the time I left, I was all in. I saw the, the pictures of uh, of Rick Hall packed and them carrying off the heavyweight after a huge victory at 7,000 packing in. I wanted to go to a place with rich tr wrestling tradition and uh, a place where you'd be acknowledged and people would show up. And so you that made the hard work a little easier. So yeah. I, uh, I'm just uh, real thankful to have my career there. So John, you got to Penn State and your career was, was stellar. Four time NCAA qualifier first Penn State wrestler to win 100 matches. Uh, 81 and 82, you were an All-American, finishing third and fifth at the NCAAs, respectively. Talk about your memories on the mat at Penn State. You know, Paul, it, um, you know, when I came in that first year at Penn State, it was Coach Lorenzo's first year. He had, he had uh, grabbed the baton from the great coach, Bill Cole, who was a Hall of Famer and, and steered Penn State to top 10 finishes for – uh, who knows how long, but so long. Uh, we had a great team on paper. I was really excited to be a part of it. I got the number one spot at 158 pounds and never lost my starting position. But that year it went, went through a lot of diversity. Uh, a couple wrestlers uh, became ineligible academically. Two other really top stars uh, had some unfortunate career ending injuries. And uh, so as a freshman, I became the uh, winningest wrestler on that team. And it was just myself and a senior, Sam Salit, that made it out to NCAAs. And so it was tough because it was tough uh, for people seeing Penn State down because uh, we had gone on a losing streak uh, against dual meets. And that was a tough time. But what made it so rewarding that within two years, we were in back in the top six of the NCAA tournament. We took four we took four wrestlers in 81 to Princeton. It was myself, Steve Scepter, Bob Burry, and Bernie Fritz. And on day one, we were number three in the country on the leaderboard after the, just the first day. We just had an amazing group of guys. We upset some of the top seeds and we had a big finish that gained Coach Lorenzo the Coach of the Year awards. And that was uh, really rewarding for me to see that because People were doubting him after that first season. They were doubting Penn State wrestling, but for me to see us back on back on track and back at the top and getting the recognition that Penn State deserved, and I think Penn State never looked back after that little hiccup there in '79. Uh, now, John, I heard the key to your success was the post weigh-in stakes at Zeno's. Can you can you talk about that? Oh my God, that was great memories. Uh, you know, what I loved about Penn State was the whole support staff and uh, and just not just the townspeople and the students that were behind the sport, but, you know, the day before weigh-ins when you're cutting five, maybe six pounds or or whatever, and that wrestling manager comes over and, and asks you, what do you want for your post weigh-in meal? <laughs> and, uh, and I'm able to say a steak medium well. As a student <laughs> athlete, that uh, doesn't have much money to go out to dinner with. That was always a great, great event for me. And it made the, uh, the pain of making weight a little less uh, easier to bear with. So John, those are great um, memories. You know, we were, we were off camera. We were talking about the group chat that you have with some of your varsity S brothers. Um, I'm sure that group chat is filled, of com filled with comments about this year's tournament. Um, you, you said, you know, you made the comment, Penn State's never looked back. And, and I think that is, that is absolutely true. We came up a little short on the team score, but boy, if we didn't steal the show Saturday night, what are your thoughts on the current state of the program and our performance at NCAAs? You know, it's, it's just so truly amazing. It's so reflective of what Kale and 
Cody and uh, Casey and Jake, that, that coaching staff that we have. Uh, yeah, the group chat really uh, is just incredible because we know this was a rebuilding year, so to speak, with six freshmen on the team. And to come away with four NCAA champions was just truly amazing and remarkable. You know, um, it's really amazing. I have my hand in coaching. I was able to coach the uh, US Dream Team about three years ago at the Pittsburgh Classic. And so I know some of the young wrestlers too. There's a 10th grade top recruit whose uh, father contacted me right after Aaron Brooks won and, and said that he has a, a sincere interest in Penn State. And I never expected that from him because he had an allegiant. He was a D1 wrestler at another school. And nobody ever expected to see this kid on Penn State's radar. So for recruiting showcase that night, that night was truly phenomenal. And we're so excited about next year and all the years to come. Yeah, look, the, the future is the future is bright. Uh, a lot of young stars, Kale and, and, and all the coaches that you, you mentioned, um, they get they have their recruiting down, right? They're, they're recruiting the right kind of student athletes to come to Penn State and and compete. And um, yeah, I, I don't see it's it's not a it's not a rebuild. It's a reload year. Yeah, which is which is truly a testament. You know, the one thing I truly appreciate, I mentioned Coach Lorenzo. And uh, he was like a father figure for all of us. Yeah. We called him Papa Bear. And, uh, and we were so thrilled when Kale came on board and left Iowa State. Well, Coach Lorenzo reached out to me and introduced me to Kale. And Kale came down to uh, Atlanta to do a camp. And I was able to go over and spend time with him. And he's always had such a great and open relationship to all the alumni that came uh, before him at Penn State, and it's really great to see, and, and I think it's part of what's made him so successful. He's really embraced the Penn State legacy and took what was there, all the solid foundation, and just added to it. This is the Penn State Alumni Association's Coffee Hour. I'm Paul Clifford. I'm joined this morning by John Han Hanrahan. He's an All-American wrestler, award-winning author, and a health and fitness pro. John, you leave Penn State in 82. And you spend the next couple of years both competing on the world stage, doing some coaching, some modeling. Talk about that period. Uh, and in particular, if you wouldn't mind talking about your connection to Dave Schultz. Absolutely. Um, I, I think folks would love to hear that. Absolutely. Well, uh, in 80, 83, I had the chance to wrestle against the Soviet Union, represent the United States which was one of my dreams fulfilled and uh, just fell short against the world, the world silver medalist, uh, you know, just came up short in an eight to nine match by one point. So I really felt that uh, I was right there in the thick of things. Dave and I had some good battles in college. Uh, I was the only one to take him down his senior year. And then uh, we wrestled in the uh, East West all-star meets. I never came out on top against them, but uh you know, I, I just uh, made me so much more of a better wrestler and a person competing with one of the legends of the sport. Uh, in 96, I, I got back into the sport because I, I, I wanted to give one more shot against Dave. And I, uh, I was, you know, older at the time and he was still in the sport, but I figured I put less wear and tear on my body. So maybe I can get back into the Olympic trials and do everything right. I went, even went down the fox catcher and trained, trained with him and all his other fox catcher teammates uh, just a few months before his tragic murder by John DuPont. I was able to spend time with Dave at the uh, New York Athletic Club Christmas tournament just about four weeks before his murder. And we went to a Christmas party together. Just uh, really was a great friend and somebody that the whole sport of wrestling admired. Uh, so... Uh, just tremendous, tremendous loss. Uh, at the time, one of my personal training clients, she was uh, Diane Sawyer, who did a, a national TV show, and she knew my relationship with Dave, and uh, she got the exclusive interview with Dave's with Dave's wife, Nancy, and uh, who knew former wrestler Greg Alinsky, who was also down at Fox Catcher Farms, and so we we hooked that up. I was able to kind of uh, help add to solidifying his legacy in my way and uh, memorialized him in kind of all I did after that. 
John, your life has seen a lot of highs for sure, but um, you've had more than your share of challenges and obstacles to overcome as well. You chronicle these trying times in your book, Wrestling with Angels. Take us back to when you were 25 and your personal battles with addiction that almost took your life. Yeah, at age 25, I, I had a near-death experience. I was um, crisscrossing the world as an international model. I'd done the big campaigns, the magazine covers, uh, and, uh, you know, had an agent in Zurich and Paris and Tokyo and uh, Milan, Italy, and uh, Eileen Ford was my agent in New York City. So it was kind of a, definitely kind of a jet set life. And uh, I, I was kind of, uh, had a void in my life because I had left my sport of wrestling. And uh, it's just the uh, void with substance abuse kind of crept in. And uh, I was kind of at a low point in my life. I knew I needed help, but it was an injection from a physician who was also an addict that gave me a drug overdose and my body actually shut down and my soul pulled out of my body and went to, that place where I didn't think I was coming back, but the one thing that I was able to ask for in front of my creator was not to let my family and brothers and sisters suffer. And I was able to return to life. And I knew at that moment, somehow, some way, I was going to share my story with the world in the right type of venue. It turned out to be a book. Uh, in my book, it's it's a journey. It's a uh, it's a life review. When you're uh, when you go through a near death experience, you you're shown your life, and so it was easy for me to write my book. And what I do is I I write it with the uh, with the truth of the human condition. It's not a vanity piece for an ex athlete. It's uh, raw and it's real, and that's why it's resonating with so many people. My wife and I have since uh, started a nonprofit called recoveryangel.org and the proceeds from the book go to help support that. And we're uh, helping so many along the way. And uh, we'll talk more about that if you want later. But uh, it's just uh, it's just something that I want to share with others. You know, when I came back, I, I didn't want to preach to others, but I did want to share the light of love of what I, and the connectivity of uh, mankind to each other. And uh, I kind of laughed because I it, I thought of that uh, preacher on the Willard steps at Penn State. I think every student knew him. Still that there. Was, he is still there. He's, he's still there. So he's so judgmental and telling you how to live your life. But we all know the right thing. It's all inside of all of us. And it's that little, that little truth that's when it's uh, uncluttered by anything else, that's the true beauty and the essence of, uh, of life and truth and love. John, you said the inspiration uh, for the book was one to tell your own story, but you really didn't get inspired to tell your story until your son faced some of the same kind of battles. Uh, did you feel like it was deja vu for you? Did you uh, talk a little bit about, you know, the battles that he faced with opioid addiction? It's a, uh, it, as you know firsthand, it's it's ravaging this country. A lot of people are dealing with it, um, but you know you were in a unique position to help him through because of your own personal journey. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and he wanted to share the story, and so uh, when I put the book together, it really opens up of of my wife and I dealing with a doctor telling us or asking us if we if we've planned his funeral because. It, the doctor knew that he was on his last leg. A lot of things were happening, not just the addiction, but uh, liver enzymes shutting down from um, hepatitis C and things like that. And, and it caught me off guard, which it shouldn't have. Me of all people, uh, a former substance abuser that had kind of gone through it. But I saw him, and I know this happens to so many parents around the country, around the world, but uh, you know, he was the perfect student, a student. Uh, had gone out for wrestling and, you know, I never pushed them into sport and, uh, you know, didn't seem to hang around with bad groups of friends and uh, I didn't seem to see any red flags. So if it happens to me, it could happen to anybody, but he nearly lost his life. And, but thankfully he regained it and uh, has several years of sobriety now and has just graduated from film school in London. I'm so proud of him and, and how he, his part of his story is, helping to inspire others. And you're right, Paul, it's, uh, 
it's the uh, it's categorized as the National Institute of, Health, Institute of Health as the deaths of despair. And during this pandemic, they've even spiked alarmingly higher. Right. It's estimated 86,000 deaths of despair just in 2020. Uh, and so it's just, it's, it's coming back into the uh, focus of the media, but, uh, but it's, it's with all the isolation and despair and, 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 and depression and anxiety that, and uh, isolation that people are going through, they, uh, it's really, it's really spiked, you know, and there's underlying causes too. It's like, you know, some, so many kids these days, and I work with, uh, I've developed a curriculum to, to teach young adults uh, the benefits of health and wellness. And one of the things I, I deal with is I deal with a lot of kids already facing depression, ADHD, and uh, anxiety. And a lot of uh, kids, if they don't get a handle on that, using exercise as a good healthy medicine or fitness or sportsmanship or, uh, or uh, you know, the uh, friendship and fellowship right. that sports gives us, it starts to, they, they begin to self-medicate with some of the drugs that are on the street and with the deadly fentanyl that's laced in these drugs, even like uh, Xanax and all these different things that kids are getting hooked on. It's just such an epidemic. And it's one that I've, my, my wife is uh, really an advocate and is helping so many different families through our uh, nonprofit re addiction recovery. Recoveryangel.org is the website. Yeah, let's talk a little bit about that. You've dedicated your life and your experiences as a world champion and a model and an author to help others. Tell us more about the nonprofit you and your wife founded, recoveryangel.org. You can look that up. I think we'll drop that, uh, that link in the chat for people um, to get more information about that. But John, you're, you're really helping others through tough times. You know, we, um, we have two addiction therapists that donate their time to us. And um, really, it's a, uh, a platform for us to help those in needs, either uh, you know, we deal with parents wanting to uh, help steer their their child or their young adult to uh, recovery and uh, we give them tips and we give them uh, we give them uh, the things to prepare for because uh, if a parent does have somebody that's suffering they need to have an action plan when that window of opportunity when that person their loved one really commits and submits to say okay i'm ready to get help because once that person is ready there's so many hoops and uh, and just the minefield of different things that you have to go through to deal with insurance companies, to deal with the right treatment center, to deal with, uh, you know, transporting that person. And uh, so we've, we've been through it. We've helped uh, several people just this past week. I've helped someone who um, was uh, had a suicidal tendencies and, and got them uh, in hospitalized and getting the proper treatment that they need. And so uh, it's rewarding that way. I've uh, been lucky to get some good national media coverage for my book, Wrestling with Angels. And that's, uh, and so the platform has spiked with helping people uh, since then. And every week, and I get numerous direct messages from, from um, people I haven't heard from in years and that have read the book or, and many people that I've never known, but but uh, reach me off my website, johnhanrahan.com and send me a message and just how much the story resonates with them. And many have given it to their son or daughter that's going into treatment to help inspire them. And um, so it's, it's been rewarding in that way. So uh, wonderful. anything Nittany Nation can do to help with that, we're fully nonprofit and, uh, and we're, uh, we're doing good, good work, good work. Absolutely. John, you also continue to help others on their personal fitness journey. I see you wearing the privatetraining.com uh, t-shirt there, repping your other business. Um, you're in many ways kind of uh, for a long time were the fitness guru to the rich and famous. Talk about your work as a health wellness professional and some of the, um, some of the, the names that we might recognize that you helped train. Well, you know, um, it's neat because um, 
my days in New York City after I finished uh, competing, I had been repped by the New York Athletic Club. So I, I was in Manhattan. I spent 10 years in New York City after college. And uh, I teamed up with uh, a trainer who uh, opened this amazing facility called La Palestra. And uh, he had a, a great stable of clients. You know, he was a trainer from Madonna and uh, a, a bunch of stars. But we put together a facility together that was just, uh, Vanity Fair called it a shrine to fitness when it opened. And uh, it was just a beautiful facility right off Central Park West, across from Tavern on the Green. So we attracted uh, all the A-list clients. Uh, and I was, it was neat for me to, to train John Kennedy Jr., you know, Howard Stern, put Julia Roberts through workouts, and uh, just an amazing array of people. We attracted a lot of the Hollywood, Hollywood clients that would come in to a week in New York. And so I, uh, I would train a, just an amazing amount of people. We used Central Park as our running track and, uh, you know, I had wrestling mats in there too. So it was uh, one side of the facility was old school gym, with climbing ropes, wrestling mats, freeways. And the other side was real high tech, but it was just, just an amazing facility, uh, kind of a who's who list. And, um, you know, Howard Stern watching us wrestle was funny because, uh, at that was about the time I decided at age 35 to go back through the Olympic trials. And then, and then I realized this uh, great Iowa wrestler, Rico Ciparelli was in town. So uh, we started training together with a number of current USA team members and he'd watch and uh, he'd say, you guys are, you guys are Neanderthals. <laughs> yeah, so that was a compliment from Howard. And I, I trained him when he'd come out to LA because it wasn't long after that, that Rico and I had, had gone out to California. I, I corralled a, a, a a list Hollywood base out there. Right. And that's where I got proclaimed by the magazines, best trainer in LA. To tell you the truth, it was easy to stand out there because I showed up as a real trainer. I had exercise science background from Penn State University. All the other trainers really, you'd hear about Hollywood trainers. They were all trying to be actors and just kind of doing this training gig on the on the side. But I showed up and uh, I had my clients and it just snowballed. I was uh, training the heads of five different studios out there and, and a number of Hollywood clients like Tim Burton, Patricia Heaton from whoever, you know, everybody loves Raymond. It turned out her high school boyfriend was in Iowa wrestled that had wrestled uh, in the NCAA tournament. So it's talk about a small world. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Mike Deanna was her high school sweetheart. But just, uh, it was fun, it was neat. And I think that's where my my young son got the film bug because I used to take him on the sets of Tim Burton movies. And now he's got his degree in filmmaking. So it's, it's kind of cool. Wonderful. John, um, while you work with others to overcome addiction, you still leave room uh, in, in that training for what you call positive addictions. Can you talk about that and how they're important to life? Yeah, one thing that I'm, I'm trying to infuse is the elements of what I provide from a wellness perspective. Because um, I've seen the treatment centers, I've seen uh, uh, what they're doing for, for people suffering from substance abuse. And the one missing element uh, is, is health and fitness and just the uh, positive endorphins that can, that, that, that can infuse. Some of the top tier facilities are doing that uh, and, I've, and, and talks with doing a collaboration with some of them. But it's just so important. You know, and wrestling gave me that. When I say when I went back into wrestling at age 35, it was that fellowship and my, uh, my sport was wrestling, is wrestling. And that has become a lifelong form of martial arts for me. And it's just a... Um, you know, spiritual in a way, because it's, uh, it's a, it's my own self test. I always know where I'm at physically, because, uh, you know, I'll have some young college guy home for the summer, you know, standing across from me trying to take my legs out. So I've learned to protect myself and even score on those guys. And, uh, <laughs> you know, when you and when you finish, uh, you know, there's always been this camaraderie with wrestlers, because I think we're, we, we've always had a chip on our shoulders that we're treated as second class citizens. We don't get the limelight of, you know, the NFL or the NBA guys, but uh, we, we do that in a way that's kind of our, our uh, self-satisfaction because we know we work hard and it's, 
it's a it's a fellowship, and it's no wonder that um, you know the Marine Corps and the Navy SEALs directly try to recruit wrestlers because they are a form of modern day warriors. And uh, so, there's that fellowship when you meet a fellow wrestler. John, at the end of the day, your story is is a story of redemption. Um, you 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 have to feel like you're standing on on the top of the podium of life, right? How much do you think your training as a wrestler helped you to fight and overcome adversity? I think about wrestlers, right? It's a team sport for sure. And you need teammates to help you get better, but you, you're one-on-one -on -one in a singlet, um, fully kind of exposed on the mat and, and all your success and imperfections are, are on display for everyone. It, I think it's that kind of adversity that you face as a wrestler that helps people through, helps people through life. Was that the case with you? Absolutely. Um, I think any successful wrestler or athlete knows that you learn mostly through your losses. And uh, I was lucky to have a lot of win, but uh, when you learn to persevere with your letdowns and your losses, it's really what forms you as a young man and something that carries over because, uh, you know, those things can just kind of cripple someone. You know, my freshman, we talked about my freshman year. I was off to a good start. The first college tournament I was in, I won, and I, and I beat a guy that was ranked fifth in the country in rec hall. And then, um, and then I, I went on a losing streak of uh, five matches in a row. And for, for a lot of the blue chip recruits coming out of high school aren't used to losing, especially five in a row. So it's a big hold to dig yourself out of. So when I look back, uh, overcoming that deficit and then finding a way to win again and then qualifying for NCAs and being named my freshman year as the uh, as the freshman uh, freshman wrestler of the year at my weight class by amateur wrestling news. That's a that was a big win for me and something I carry on and I, I try to use to uh, help others. You know, uh, one of our champs this year was a freshman and he had lost his first varsity match. And so yeah. His name was Storaki, Carter Storaki. And so just an amazing testament. And, uh, and just the way that young man came back and just became stronger from that loss. And uh, I don't think he ever lost again. He lost in Big Ten finals, but then he won the NCAA championships against the guy that uh, beat him in the Big Ten finals. So, you know, losing teaches you a lot. Uh, you know, so when I talk about those five losses my freshman year, I think it really did put me in a depression. And so I can kind of put myself in – in other people's shoes, and and when I try to understand what that's like and what that what it, what it's like to go through that, it really helps me to kind of, uh, you know, have a um, sensitivity to help others. Absolutely, Carter Storacci, great example. Totally, I think just in in the period of the fifteen matches or so that he had this year, I think he transformed himself as a wrestler from that first time on the mat. A close nine eight loss uh, got down big. Uh, to a wrestler from Indiana. Uh, that's a story that kid from Indiana is going to tell for the rest of his life, by the way, right? The day, the day he beat Carter Storacci because Carter's on a trajectory to, to potentially be a, a four-time national champion. Um, but, but Kale's just got a way to get people to look at, to look at themselves and, and be ready for, for those three days in March. Uh, that's really what it seems like the team is prepared to do is to perform at the highest level on those three days in March. It really is. He has a he has a way of uh, having them enter that without without putting extra pressure on him because I think he, he just reminds them all it's just such a tremendous opportunity. Uh, and I think that's looking back on my life as a young athlete, that's uh, a reminder like that is so important. Just just that opportunity, that four or five years that you have, and. Uh, and it's just, uh, you know, you make the most of it and there's, there's no reason to put extra pressure and just control what you can control. And uh, the results have just been amazing. I mean, the winning percentage in the NCAA semifinals and the winning percentage in the NCAA fi finals itself, it's just incredible. This is the Penn State Alumni Association's Coffee Hour. I'm Paul Clifford. I'm joined this morning by John Hanrahan, All-American wrestler, fitness guru, award-winning author, uh, it's been great to have John on Coffee Hour. John, at the end, we like to have a little bit of fun here. So I'm going to throw some quick questions at you and you just uh, answer with the first thing that pops to mind. So your favorite Penn State memory? Well, my favorite Penn State memories, um, you know, um, 
I got two that come to mind real quick. And, and the first is um, my final NCAA podium. Dave Schultz was at the top of it. Uh, I was on the podium with them and then over the, the uh, house speakers, when they, when they introduced me, they introduced me as the winningest wrestler in Penn State history uh, with 105 wins. And, and just knowing the rich tradition of Penn State, uh, I was disappointed in not being at the top of that podium, but it just made me feel that I had a connection to Penn State for life, that I, at least I, I added something to it. And my other, real quick, in 2011, I mentioned I got to know Kale, and then I was down on the, the floor in 2011 in the medal round when uh, Penn State just clinched clinched the uh, national championship, the first one since 1953. I happened to be back in the hallway right off the main floor, and then I saw Kale coming off, and I looked at him, and, and he gave me a big embrace. And I don't think he's a big emotional guy or anything, but I'll never forget that because uh, that meant a lot to me. John, how about your favorite class at Penn State? You know, my favorite class, it's, um, it was known as, one, I think, one of the best shows on campus. It was uh, Religious Studies with Dr. Dr. Charles Prebish. But, uh, you know, it was a big class. I sat way in the back, and it was early morning. I'd, I'd get myself over to class. And the uh, first day I was in there, he was, he was giving a lecture and talking about situations. And I almost fell out of my chair when he incorporated a situation in my wrestling mat the day before on Sunday in rec hall into the lecture. <laughs> and he, and uh, it turned out he was an avid wrestling fan. And, uh, and, and he, he talked a lot about how sport can be uh, kind of sport can be religion and fellowship for others. And so I'll, I, I keep in close contact with him. And uh, actually his son became a great junior champion wrestler and uh, and uh, I think he's coaching now down in Virginia, Robbie Priebus. John, if you could have dinner with anyone, who would it be and why? Well, you know, um, I think I really want to spend more time with Kale and, and Cody and Casey and Jake Varner, the four of them at the dinner table, just because, you know, anything that, that I can uh, learn and share from those guys, uh, just uh, they got a magic formula and just, uh, I'm just so, I just have such high high regard for those guys. John, knowing how humble it is, it's gonna be really tough to get those guys to talk about themselves though. <laughs> no, I know. Hey, I have a way. I've sat with I've sat with a lot of VIPs. I I sat next to dinner with uh, Grace Jones, Dolph Lundgren, Andy Warhol, a bunch of people, but uh, you know, intimate tables in New York say, City. But uh, uh, well, I'll get those guys talking. John, your, your wrestling's taken you all over the world. Um, what's your most unusual we are moment? Kind of that unexpected place where somebody yelled out we are and it caught you by surprise. Believe it or not, two years ago uh, in the airport landing in Bulgaria, I was coming down coming down the, uh, the hallway there and uh, I got a big we are shout out because I had a little Penn State gear just on a jacket. And uh, so that was amazing in Bulgaria. And I, I like to do a lot of bike trail riding. And in Alpharetta, I got one just uh, last month, you know, just uh, about 15 miles in. And I got uh, a biker that passed me by and gave me a big we are. And at the Kroger and the gro local grocery store. <laughs> so, so many different places, Paul. And that's really incredible. And it really picks you up and gives you that, that little extra energy. Absolutely. We were talking uh, earlier about all the Penn Staters down there in the, down there in Georgia and the Atlanta area. Our great chapter down there doing some good work. Uh, I just spoke at their Diamonds Over Georgia, their Thon fundraiser event that they do down there last week. And so they, they do a fantastic job. John, besides Penn State wrestling, what is your favorite Penn State sport? You know, when I was there, I really loved the gymnastics program, both the men's and the women's. It was an incredible show. I think they hosted the nationals there too. So I got to see gymnasts from all over the country. So at that time, we really, uh, we really marveled at really their excellence and just uh, some of the best of the best. Uh, in 83, I got to see Penn State football win the Sugar Bowl and shut down Herschel Walker. And that was a, that, that was a great. So Penn State football is a given. I love them. I hang out my Penn State flag in my Georgia driveway every football weekend. And, uh, 
And so, um, but I think I really feel for our men's gymnastics. I know they've lost so many programs and wrestling has half the, half the number of programs than when I competed. And so the, those two sports, I really feel for them. And shout out to Stanford wrestling. I hope the Stanford University uh, reconsiders their, their uh, decision to drop wrestling. They just had a national champion. So uh, shout out to anybody that can help save Stanford wrestling, because I hate to see these wonderful programs go down. They have a 102 year history as a um, as a uh, core sport for Stanford University. Absolutely. And, and look, fellow Penn Stater, Kerry McCoy um, was was a was a great coach out there for Stanford before coming over to to Maryland here in the Big Ten. Absolutely. You know, he's he's running their RTC, their regional Olympic training center out there. And and, you know, what's tra even more tragic the uh, supporters of Stanford wrestling raised twelve and a half million dollars yeah. to endow the program, and for some reason, this administrator is not accepting it, and so that's tragic. And there was a lot of, a lot of chance and support of that uh, for that Stanford wrestler for him to win an NCAA national title was amazing. With it was amazing. It was a shame that um, he did not wear the the university's brand because of what's going on. I mean, that's a um a, somewhat of a black eye to the institution for for how they've how they've handled this um i've been in higher education a long time and i i don't know of too many administrators that turn 12 million dollars down um if if finance is one of the the reasons for cutting a program but yeah look uh, men's gymnastics we've had we've had coach from uh men's gymnastics on this program before um wrestling uh our two uh, fantastic college sports that are that are in jeopardy now. Uh, we I just saw the list of four or five uh, places around the country dropping their wrestling program at the end of this year. Um, it is good to see some others picking it up. Um, some other institutions have added. I saw the Arkansas Little Rock making an appearance at the NCAA's this year, but um, it, it's it's such a wonderful sport that so many people enjoy, and I hope it finds a I hope it can solidify a home in the NCAA. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, in 2013, we went, we went through the um, the quest to save Olympic wrestling, and uh -huh. uh, you know, thankfully they reconsidered that. But um, you know, wrestling is uh, you know it's become the feeder sport for the UFC. So we do have a pro league, and uh, that's something that's that's real. And the uh, the the sport of folk style wrestling is uniquely American, and right. it, is uh, something that really carries over into life like we talked about. Yeah, you talked about the, the quest to save Olympic wrestling. I mean, we know Kale Sanderson played a, played a big part in that, but no one played a bigger role than Dan Gable. You don't, you don't want to get in any situation where you're on the other side of Dan Gable because, um, because he always comes out on top, right? And uh, I think of all the things he's been able to accomplish in wrestling and certainly Hall of Famer and legendary coach at Iowa and uh, – uh, fantastic wrestler uh, during his day. His crowning achievement, I think, is saving Olympic wrestling. Yeah, he's a great ambassador and he's real selfless with his time uh, for that cause. When I was a 14-year-old uh, kid and my coach took me to NCAA Nationals to watch, he said, now I'm going to take you down the wrestling room between sessions. And then there he was, Dan Gable. I went up to him as a little kid and I said, you want to go take down? He said, no, kid, not now. But I sat against the wall dejected, and, and then he wrestled against all the big stars and uh, beat them all. And he came over to me and grabbed my hand and goes, let's go take downs, kid. So I'll live <laughs> That's great. John, last question. Your favorite flavor of creamery ice cream? Oh, my God. You know, um, my freshman year, I was um, I was over at the art department a lot. I started my, started my Penn State um, career as a uh, photography art major and so that creamery there I discovered it and I'd go over and get that strawberry ice cream with those big chunks of strawberry in there I loved it and that that was uh that's where I spent my money over at the over at the creamery with that strawberry flavor that, that was is wonderful well John we want to thank you for joining us this morning on coffee hour your story is is an inspiration to many people your um you're you're doing some great work there you go promote the book wrestling with angels uh you can find that on amazon.com you can find more information at johnhanrahan.com 
uh, check out the addictionrecovery.org. Uh, I'm sorry, angel, recoveryangel.org. Yes, recoveryangel.org. Thank you. Absolutely. John, thanks again for joining us. I want to thank all of you for joining us as well. If you're a member of the Penn State Alumni Association, thank you so much for your support. If you're not, what are you waiting for? Go to our website today at alumni.psu.edu and you too can become a member of the world's largest alumni association. Thank you for all you do for the university, for the glory and for the future. We are Penn State.